Stalin Burgess came to Marblehead in 1904. He came here as a yacht designer. For a number of years, he built yachts here uh, and eventually got interested in aviation. In 1909, after seeing the Wright Brothers' success in the air, he decided that this was a field that he'd like to get into, that he thought he could be successful in and Marblehead was an ideal place because it had the still working, it had the facilities, it had the ocean on which they could use hyper airplanes. They had all the pieces coming together. And so he started. He started with Augustus Herring, who was his consultant. Augustus Herring had worked with the Wrights, with Samuel Pierpoint Langley, and with Octave Chanute. He knew the aeronautical business, he couldn't necessarily build airplanes, but he could tell Starling and the workmen in Marblehead how to develop the curve of the wing. He could bring with him an engine that could power the airplane, and hopefully he could fly it as well. And he did just that. In 1910, on February the 28th, on Chewbacca Lake in Hamilton, that was the beginning. In addition, Starling recruited Norman Prince of Beverly Farms and Greeley Curtis of Boston and Manchester, both North Shore people who brought interesting and important skills to Starling's operation. Greeley was a successful engineer, and one of the things he brought was his engineering skill, but he also brought his capital because as a successful engineer, he had made a lot of money he set it aside, and he was a wise investor. Really got into aviation with Starling. And that was a partnership that continued through 1918. Norman Prince was a uh, interested young man in, in the law and in college, but he was more interested in aviation than anything else. And so he tagged along with Starling went to him, went with him to all of the places that um, where aviation was, aviation experiments were occurring. And eventually uh, worked with Starling in his test flight program up in Palm Island. Norman went on in later years to found the Lafayette Estreville in France in the First World War. And got his start, obviously, with Starling. Uh, Starling with him, learned to fly at the Wright Brothers School in Georgia. Uh, Stalin was his mentor in aviation. And when Norman went his own way, he took that experience uh, as, a, as a basic training in aeronautics, uh, which propelled him into uh, posterity as a founder of the Lafayette Escadrille and a very successful aviator.
Carl in. Um, Stalin Burgess bought some land on Redstone Lane uh, on the harbor and started his uh, boat building operation there in 1904. <clears throat> as time went on, particularly as he got into 1908 and 1909, he knew he would need more space if he was going to get into this aeronautical business. So he built himself additional workshops on Redstone Lane. The airplanes were built there, the original uh, aircraft were built there, and then they knew that they had a, some open space nearby to, to test, uh, and the first open space that they found that was far enough away to give them some security and privacy uh, was Palm Island. So they had a steam yacht called the Ox. They loaded up the Ox uh, in uh, June, excuse me, in uh, April 1910 and took the aircraft up to Plum Island. And so from April until late August 1910, they flew all of their early aircraft, the first three aircraft, uh, on the Plum Island marshes. Uh, these aircraft were on skids, uh, wheels, and they needed the marsh grass, the wet marsh grass, to permit them uh, to get off the surface and to fly effectively. When they finished their testing up at uh, Plum Island, they could fly uh, probably two or three miles distance, which was uh, outstanding when you consider that the first flight of Javak Lake uh, went a distance of about 130 yards. Yeah, one of the, one of the important uh, things that Stalin Burgess realized was that <clears throat> he was going to need his, not only his own mathematical and design skills. He was going to need uh, some aeronautical expertise, which he brought in Augustus Herring. Once that was accomplished, he then knew that he was going to need capital, far more capital than he could generate in the art business. And that's when he reached out to really Curtis to make an investment in the company. That capital and that expertise uh, served to get them started. And their business generated subsequently was a, was a sufficient cash flow to permit them to hire the additional people and to expand Redstone Lane. That continued until 19, late 1916, when the Curtis Company, with substantial orders from overseas, because the First World War had started in Europe, needed additional factory space. He came to Burgess and made him an offer. He would buy the Burgess Company for $250,000 in cash, 2,000 common shares, and 2,000 preferred shares. Uh, Burgess didn't take too long to decide. He agreed because he knew he didn't have the capital to expand any further than Redstone Lane. When Curtis <coughs> took over the company, he then developed an expansion program for Marblehead. And that's when the first plant at Little Harbor uh, was built in 1917. So they actually had two modern assembly plants at Little Harbor and the older, more classic uh, operation that they had at Redstone Lane. All of those plants were producing aircraft right through November 1918. In 1918, as the war went to a close, in November the 7th, there was a false armistice uh, declared. It wasn't the official armistice, it was the rumor. And interestingly enough, that night, plant number one burned to Little Harbor. Uh, it was full of combustibles because that was the nature of the construction of the aircraft. Uh, but that really <clears throat> provided the death knell for the Burgess manufacturing facility here in Marblehead, now owned by the Curtis Company. Once that occurred, and once the armistice, the official armistice was declared on November the 11th, all government contracts were canceled. So the winding down process continued. The workers were given severance pay, and there was an effective uh, winding down over the next year. So by the end of 1919, all of the aircraft business in Marble had ended, and Burgess, came back a year later 
to reestablish his yacht design business. But that was the end of the era of aviation in Marblehead and to a large extent in Essex County. Stalin Burgess, when he started here in Massachusetts, uh, accomplished one significant task in the very beginning in 1910. He made the first flight in New England at Chewbacca Lake. Uh, he built the airplane with Augustus Herring. Augustus Herring made that first flight. But Starling uh, designed that airplane, uh, handled all the logistics to get the airplane to Chewbacca and more importantly, arranged for the capital to build it and to fly it. Uh, Starling uh, and his business here in Marblehead uh, was an innovator. And one of his innovations was developing a stepped float, which was used in high river airplanes, to permit them effectively to get off the water. Uh, it was very difficult for flat bottom floats on aircraft to effectively propel a machine from the water into the air. And in Marblehead Harbor, in 1911, Stalin Burgess made the first flight off water that landed back on the water. And from that point on, most of the early experimenters, most of the early aviation companies, used Stalin Burgess's floats, either directly or floats that were designed and patented by him. The first plane, was called or nicknamed the Flying Fish. This was the airplane built in late 1909 and flown for the first time in February 1910 at Chewbacca Lake in Hamilton. Uh, it was called the Flying Fish uh, because they needed a name for it and they didn't know how many they were going to build and they didn't know whether this one was going to be successful. After it was sold, they called it the Model A because now they knew they had enough money to build Model B. So they started to work on Model B, an improvement on the first airplane. And this airplane was flight tested up at Plum Island. Uh, after a summer of uh, disconcerting crashes, uh, no fatalities, thank God, uh, they ended up with a modified airplane which they labeled Model C. Uh, so in that in that first year, they had Model A, Model B, Model C. Model D was a design that they put together uh, as they did Model E, uh, which they uh, tested, they designed and tested here at Hathaway Farm in Marblehead. The next model was an interesting one, and this is their Model F. The Model F, if you can follow the alphabet, was a licensed version of the Wright Brothers Model B, which was a very successful exhibition aircraft. The, at the uh, Swan meet, Wilbur Wright had seen a Burgess aircraft, and although he was not enthused about the design aspects of that aircraft, he saw it was well constructed, well built. And he convinced Starling that Starling could build a very effective and very popular and profitable airplane if he had taken the right Model B design and, and built it in his shops in Marblehead, which Starling did. So he had signed a license agreement. That was the first license agreement for aircraft in the United States. It was a very successful aircraft because it was built, built better than the Wright brothers' own aircraft. It was used by exhibition pilots who found it very handy that the aircraft would disassemble 
and fit it to a railroad boxcar. So in between exhibitions, they'd load it on a boxcar, take it to the next town, reassemble it again, and do this over and over again. But because it had that capability and the capability for interchangeable parts, which the original Wright aircraft did not, it turned out to be a very successful commercial product. From that point, they made another model of this airplane and put it on floats. Uh, this was called the, the Model F Hydro Airplane. Also a very popular aircraft, very effective aircraft. Uh, they then went on to uh, an alphabet listing of aircraft, some of which were major, some of which were minor, some of which were only named and never built. Uh, so after the, the F, they skipped down to a few that they didn't build until they got to the Model H. The Model H was a tractor, that is the prop on the front aircraft, with a fuselage, which was different from the aircraft they had built before, more traditional looking aircraft, which they sold to the Army, the Army Air Service. Uh, that was an innovation. It wasn't a particularly uh, wonderful aircraft as far as the Army was concerned, but it was their first tractor airplane, and they modified it until they, they could use it effectively. They went from that to the next aircraft, which was became very popular, the Burgess Dunn. Uh, this was a design originated in England by John Dunn. Uh, Starling took advantage again of the licensing agreements and had the rights to the Burgess Dunn, or to build the Dunn in the United States. This plane was inherently stable. It was popular from the very beginning because it could, could mean that inexperienced pilots could fly this thing safely. Uh, for this, he won the Collier Trophy, trophy uh, in 1914, which was a very prestigious award uh, that had previously been won by the Wright brothers, by Glenn Curtis, and now by Stalin Burgess. And that put him on the map. Starling said to himself, this airplane could be successful in the United States because it could be an area of yacht. It would be an aircraft easy to fly, with its inherent stability, it would be thought to be easy to build and test, and particularly if you could put it on water, it would combine the air with the ocean, and in effect, an area of the yacht that he could sell to sportsmen. That's effectively what he did. Uh, he brought it here, he tested it, he improved it, and he successfully marketed it to the 400 top families in the United States. Uh, he was successful in selling 10 or 12 of them uh, to Whitney, to Astor, uh, to the Scripps family, uh, and to others who came to Marblehead to buy these airplanes and use them successfully as conveyances. Most of them hired pilots to fly them, but they in many cases could actually fly them themselves as well. Mr. Astor came and not only bought an airplane, but asked uh, the Burgess Company to build a hangar, a floating hangar, that could be towed behind his yacht. So he had the best of both worlds. He had an area of the yacht, and a yacht, uh, and a hangar to keep the area of the yacht in. From that point on, he was able to sell upwards of 15 or 20 of these Burgess Duns. Uh, had approximately $7,000 to $11,000 a copy. And this was a lot of money in those days. The multiplier was something near 10. So we're talking about $80,000 or $70,000 in current money. Uh, so it was, it was a successful airplane, a very, a very uh, profitable one for Burgess. He then went on to uh, his, his later aircraft, uh, which were primarily built for the military they got more interested in developing an air service, both the Navy uh, and the Army Air Service, and th the Marine Corps through, through the Navy. In fact, the first naval aviator, uh, first Marine aviator, uh, was trained here at Marblehead Harbor on one of these uh, early uh, Model F hydro airplanes. The, uh, the airplane business after 
after 1916 was really a Curtis business. These were Curtis designs built in Marblehead in which there was really no design input by Stalin Burgess himself. He knew enough, as I mentioned earlier, to get out of the business when the time was right, um, which he did very effectively. And as I mentioned earlier, they all got out getting fully paid for the work they had done. And all of them went on to something else. But while they were here, they built uh, upwards of 300 of their own aircraft. And they built almost 600 of the Curtis aircraft. So we're talking about 900 to 1,000 aircraft built in Marblehead uh, over the period 1910 through 1918. So, it had its time, its time came to an end, and as far as we know, it all ended successfully. It all ended, uh, like all good stories should, uh, with a happy ending for all, including the employees who worked for the company.